So I have a script written out for this video, but the intro I just kind of wanted to go off the cuff. Um, back years ago when I realized I had this condition, or disorder I guess, I watched some YouTube videos about it and at the time I thought, you know, like this is really good information to have and I'm glad that I'm not alone or that I'm not going crazy, but it wasn't from the perspective of somebody who, um, I don't know, it's hard to describe. I wanted to put my voice out there and it's been in the back of my mind for ages before I even had a YouTube channel. So now that I have a platform, I figured, you know what, it's time for me to make this video. Alright, that's enough introduction. Um, I'm just gonna dive right in. So I want to talk about something that I haven't seen talked about from this perspective. I'm not really the kind of channel to do videos like this, but I think this could potentially be helpful to people who, like me, didn't have any clue what was going on with them until 15 or so years down the line. If you saw the title of the video, then you already know that I'm talking about depersonalization. Now the full name of this condition is Depersonalization Derealization Disorder, but for the sake of brevity I'll be calling it depersonalization only. It's still a long word, I know, but bear with me. I'll read the Mayo Clinic's explanation because it's a decent summary of what I experience. Depersonalization derealization disorder occurs when you persistently or repeatedly have the feeling that you're observing yourself from outside your body or you have a sense that things around you aren't real or both. Feelings of depersonalization and derealization can be very disturbing and may feel like you're living in a dream. Many people have a passing experience of depersonalization or derealization at some point. But when these feelings keep occurring or never completely go away and interfere with your ability to function, it's considered depersonalization derealization disorder. This disorder is more common in people who've had traumatic experiences. Depersonalization derealization disorder can be severe and may interfere with relationships, work, and other daily activities. The main treatment for depersonalization derealization disorder is talk therapy, psychotherapy, although sometimes medications are also used. So in my case, I had a traumatic experience when I was very, very young. Like, toddler young. And the thing about really bad things is sometimes your brain intentionally prevents you from remembering them as a defense mechanism. And we're not talking about repressed memories or anything like that. I mean that literally the part of your brain responsible for forming memories gets figuratively unplugged for the duration of that trauma. Sometimes a bad thing is remembered in disturbing detail to make sure you can protect yourself against it in the future. Other times that bad thing is so bad that the memory does more harm to you than the protection it could potentially provide. As an aside, I guess repressed memories, as in buried memories, are a contentious issue in the realm of psychology. A lot of professionals have claimed they don't really exist, usually because of the reason I explained above about not keeping the memory full stop, and it's too easy for the human mind to concoct a false memory for us to trust in it. Back to the topic, I was traumatized very intensely when I was in an important developmental stage, and worst of all, I didn't really know that it happened at all. I know bits and pieces, like the edges of a puzzle, but I'm fairly certain of what exactly took place, but at the time I wasn't aware at all. This meant that not only did I not know, but no one around me knew I'd gone through something like that. So the issue continually got worse over the years without intervention. To be clear, I'm not ever fully recovering from this. It's a part of how my mind ended up developing, so whether or not early intervention would have done much for me is, well, it's not worth considering since what's done is done, but I have a feeling I would still be living with it regardless. My parents were very detached people, in a way, so when I started acting weird and experiencing weird symptoms, they kind of brushed it off and made it seem like either it happened because I was doing something wrong or that it was inconsequential and gonna go away on its own. So I learned early on not to tell anyone, because it was my own issue and I was just being a stupid crybaby about it. But anyway, what was I experiencing? The entire experience of depersonalization for me can be broken down into four phases, I'd say. There's the resting state, or normal-ish, which consists of being okay for most of the time despite sometimes getting the feeling things aren't quite right, or my face would jump scare me because I don't recognize it, or just dissociating now and then. 
Afterwards, there's the bearable phase, which is a more intense and constant sensation of not being real, my body being wrong, like I wasn't supposed to have a body at all, and the inability to experience strong emotions without dissociating. This phase isn't fun, <laughs> but most of the time it can be dealt with using grounding techniques or by simply being aware that it's happening and calming down. Then there's the rock bottom phase. This one is kind of what it sounds like. It really, really sucks. Its effects vary, but normally it's an oppressive lack of motivation, self-loathing, visual distortions, and being very, very tired. I've had it manifest alternatively as the inability to sleep for long periods of time full stop, however, as well as agoraphobia, which is a recent one. I'll often be shaky, feel incredibly anxious or depressed, or both. The fourth and final phase is usually the shortest. Mania. Like in bipolar disorder, I'll go through these short bursts of over-optimism, a lack of foresight or realism, high motivation and restless energy, usually for a day or two at most. It'll take place usually right after a long stretch of the bearable phase, or any occurrence of the rock bottom phase, like a pendulum swinging in the entire opposite direction. For me, the resting phase and bearable phase take turns week to week, sometimes in longer stretches, in which I experience fluctuating sensations of unreality, with a distinctive overarching feeling that I'm dreaming, or my eyes are akin to a VR helmet strapped to me. I'll zone out a lot, and also dissociate, which is a different thing, to the point of forgetting entire interactions because I was running on autopilot unknowingly. I'll have visual snow, which is like seeing a static overlaid over your vision. And I'll be strongly affected by bright lights. I don't know why, but fluorescent lighting can trigger dissociation in me. Let me know if any of you out there experience this as well, because I don't know if it's specific to my trauma or if it's just like a hypersensitivity thing. When I first learned I had depersonalization, it was a weird coincidence, I guess. Oh, the dog's here. I'd been browsing online and saw some artistic renditions of mental illnesses. The last one in the list showed someone floating outside their body watching themselves, and it was labeled as depersonalization. I hadn't heard of that before, so I looked it up and was shocked how many of those things I thought were just normal were actually symptoms of depersonalization derealization disorder. Things like my memories feeling like they'd happened to someone else, having mild hallucinations in the form of walls bending or lights changing intensity, but being aware that they weren't real, stuff like that. Yes, I thought that was just something that happened now and then, because when I tried to broach the subject, my parents always made it seem like I was exaggerating some typical experience and it wasn't worth talking about, let alone worrying over. So after learning about the disorder, I kind of just sat on that information for a while, until I eventually asked to go to therapy and had my suspicions confirmed by a psychologist who helped me a lot initially with understanding what it meant to dissociate and, more importantly, why it was happening, therefore how to avoid it. I didn't get a lot more out of four different therapists than that tidbit, unfortunately. The treatment for depersonalization derealization disorder usually involves techniques to manage symptoms, usually grounding techniques that help you get past that disconnect between yourself and the world around you. Unfortunately for me, grounding techniques cause me to dissociate and stop processing stimuli altogether out of being generally overwhelmed. If I get lucky and that doesn't happen, instead it's a very temporary solution and not a super effective one at that. Believe me, I've spent years working on it. Don't listen to what I'm saying and assume that means it's incurable. I'm a case where it'll stick with me and that's just something I need to accept, but it's usually not like that. Therapy can be super helpful in addressing the underlying cause, trauma or otherwise, to resolve the feelings that cause the disorder. The available grounding techniques might do wonders for you as well. If you find nothing is really helping, here's what works best for me. I get easily overwhelmed, which causes dissociation. To avoid that, I learn to recognize what discussions or stimuli specifically overwhelm me and remove them from my environment to the best of my ability. For example, I have difficulty discussing politics and or philosophy, sometimes, in which I explain to people that I'd really like to talk about anything else. Other things that cause me to freak out include repetitive sounds like pen clicks, because derealization can create this hyper-aware state 
and it becomes the only thing I focus on and feels like someone repeatedly poking me directly in the eardrum. Sometimes I can't just grab the hand of whoever is clicking the damn pen and rip it from their grip, in which case I will either move somewhere else if possible or put in headphones. Worst case, I cover my ears. Yes, it's kind of embarrassing for a grown woman to be sitting in public and like slamming her palms over her ears and clenching her eyes shut, but hey, it helps. On top of that, I also worked super hard to reconcile stressful emotions and memories to decrease things that provoked my depersonalization. That takes a long while, but is well worth the time. I did most of that through sitting down and talking to myself about it, or people I was close to, but talk therapy is usually a more effective alternative. My attitude towards life shifted as a whole at some point, which I'd say is honestly the biggest improvement to my situation. I moved out of my parents' house, which was a toxic environment for me, and it suddenly became clear that things didn't have to be so stifling and miserable, which allowed me to explore things I actually enjoyed and work on projects, hobbies, find what made life worth living. Portuguese cooking played a pretty big role in all of that. Another thing about depersonalization that I learned through research and listening to the testimonies of people who have been through it was that the disorder is commonly associated with drug addiction and withdrawal. When an addicts start going clean, they will sometimes end up stuck in that rock bottom phase I was telling you about, and it's intense enough to cause relapses. That provides a bit of perspective both to myself as someone who doesn't know what it's like to not have the disorder, and to the people who can't conceptualize how deeply it affects the lives of people like me. Substance use and abuse can also trigger episodes of depersonalization which, thankfully, aren't permanent in most cases. The last time I was in rock bottom mode was actually relatively recently. I still did things, thankfully I've had enough experience being in that phase to cope with it more or less, but I avoided anything I absolutely needed to do. I took time off work, I didn't go shopping, I didn't talk to friends, I just barely fed myself or did things like brush my teeth or shower. I was so trapped in this oppressive bubble of unreality and self-loathing, the derealization hitting any time I was outside of my apartment, that I was putting my all into just waking up and getting through the day. But it's not usually like that. In my 20-ish years of coping with this condition, things have gotten a lot better. I don't struggle as much with the anxiety or depression, thanks mostly to medication that I'm still sort of figuring out, but I also have optimism, which is a relatively new development in my life. I know the worst will go away. I have so many people I care about and things I look forward to that I know it'll be worth it to stick it out. Now I'm going to talk about the more harrowing side of depersonalization, which took place between the ages of 8 and 14 for me. If you're deeply affected by discussion of not wanting to be alive, you may want to click away now. So, like I said, I experienced depersonalization in phases. When I was around eight years old is when I had my first ever rock bottom to my knowledge, and it shook my whole world. I was convinced my friends didn't care about me. I became invested in delusional beliefs. I couldn't understand why I felt the way I did. It led up after not too long, thankfully, but it was sort of the catalyst into this delusion that I literally wasn't supposed to exist. <sighs> My feelings of unreality and specifically a constant dreamlike haze over everyday life had me convinced that I wasn't real, or that the world wasn't real, or some measure of both. I was in the wrong place and I was certain of it. That feeling became more and more intense as the years went on, culminating in an entire plan to take my own life when I was 11. And I want to mention this as a sort of morbid but funny tidbit. The reason I didn't do it at the time was because of the video game Corpse Party. When in the haunted school of that video game, your final moment before your death would stay with you forever, so if you died painfully, you'd always be in pain. The idea that I could be stuck for eternity experiencing the pain I would at my death seemed so exponentially worse than what I was going through that I chickened out and started looking into painless deaths. I didn't tell anyone that I'd planned to do this at all until years later. In fact, I don't think I ever told my parents about it. But shortly afterwards, when I'd found a method that wouldn't hurt, 
My friend called my parents to fill them in on my plan, and I was taken to doctors. From there, I was diagnosed with depression and checked in on now and then, but it really wasn't just that. I didn't want to tell the doctors that I thought I wasn't real, because I thought it sounded too crazy and weird, so I just kept it to myself and pretended I was just upset about other stuff. And everyone fell for it! <laughs> Yay for me, I could suffer in silence for another six years before finding out what was going on. <sighs> to make a long story short, depersonalization tainted my childhood. I didn't develop well emotionally and still struggle when experiencing a lot of sadness, happiness, whatever happy to this day. I was far more affected by having neglectful parents than I otherwise would have been because I needed something more that they just didn't give me. I spent so long wrapped in delusions that I missed out on a lot of pivotal childhood milestones. So what is it like for me on a daily basis now that I'm an adult with medications and a support system? Um, I promise it's not as bad as it seems. My dreams are so vivid such that it's impossible for me to tell when something is or isn't real until I wake up. Recognizing myself in the mirror is about a 50-50 chance. I'll dissociate randomly now and then when I least expect it and be missing chunks of memories. If my hand touches my arm unintentionally, it'll feel like it wasn't me and cause me to jump. This goes for my legs and feet as well, resulting in frequent leg spasms. And that's the worst of it for the most part. Thank God for my meds because before I was on antidepressants and anti-anxiety stuff, I would experience somatic manifestations of anxiety all the time, and that aggravated my sense of unreality. To put that sentence into regular English, instead of feeling stressed or anxious, I would get stabbing pains or cramps without explanation, and it made me think that I could be in some sort of dream where, in the waking world, I was being hurt and not able to do anything about it. There's a lot more to it. Some technical stuff about my specific instance of trauma compiled with parental neglect, so on and so forth. But that's kind of all I wanted to talk about. I don't think a lot of people are aware of depersonalization derealization disorder, so hopefully this gave insight. And I'll recommend strongly this video by Psych2Go about depersonalization derealization because it's honestly pretty spot on. Also, if you're wondering whether or not you might be experiencing this, please consult a doctor. A lot of different conditions have overlapping symptoms, and it can be hard for you to tell for yourself what's going on. I want to wrap up this video by saying that depersonalization and all that entails is not some sort of death sentence or eternal misery. Everyone's life has ups and downs, and for someone like me, that manifests in a very specific way. But at the end of the day, there's so much I am capable of, and same with you, whoever you are, whatever you're doing, mentally ill or otherwise. You won't ever get a chance to find out what life has in store if you don't keep at it. And every day I'm thankful that I'm still here despite it all. I'm thankful that you're here. Thank you for watching and take care. If you'd like to support me or my silly audio roleplay channel, my coffee page, I think that's how you say it, K-O-F-I page is in the pinned comment. And I do have a little thanks icon at the bottom, I guess, if you want to support me that way as well. Or instead. This is probably the only video like this one that I'll ever do, so if you're wondering whether or not to subscribe after this, I'd say probably don't. <laughs> Unless you like audio roleplays and gaming streams, in which case please do. Alright, <laughs> I think that's enough.